This is New Cap News with Nicole Stilger. Good evening and thanks for joining us. The Border Tribal Council and the Saskatchewan Indian Gaming Authority have announced that they've reached an agreement for terms on a long-term lease for a casino in Lloydminster. The announcement states construction of the facility will result in long-term employment for the area. No word on when shovels will be in the ground for the casino. The group is also working in partnership with eight other First Nations in northwest Saskatchewan to construct a new mall designed to house international entertainment, recreation and retail facilities. Facilities. We'll have more on this as the story develops. Well, the Riverside Health Complex in Turtleford is benefiting from a generous bequest of a well-known Mervyn resident, Faye Tomlinson. More than $630,000 was gifted to be spent exclusively at the hospital. In 2016, 2017, about $438,000 was spent on a number of necessities, including replacing beds for long-term residents and acute care patients, installing ceiling lifts and tracking inpatient and resident rooms, replacing the blanket warmer for long-term care residents, an upgraded chemistry analyzer for the lab and the purchase of a new vital signs monitor. Now the items bought were based on Prairie North's capital planning process, which included identifying priority equipment. PNHR says other purchases will be considered through the same process. As farmers continue to get closer and closer to getting in the fields, their children will soon be joining them. That's why Agriculture Partners in Alberta held a young farm worker training workshop at Lakeland College yesterday. Nick Nielsen has more. Students from grades 10 to 12 were shown around all sorts of agricultural activity. Many of these students grew up on the farm but could use more training to keep up with a constantly changing business. The equipment stuff is really interesting because that's always changing and um, the evolution of equipment just keeps moving. So that's one thing that year after year it might be the same session but you're always learning something new as the equipment grows. Students were taught in some of the major aspects of agriculture including livestock and chemical handling as well as heavy duty machinery. Organizers hope to have more events like this across Alberta in the next year. I'm hoping to get something going up in the Grand Prairie area next year as well as we're looking for something around Calgary. With all the large equipment around, safety was one of the biggest focuses of the day. Between handling chemicals and animals, even students from the farm have things they can learn. The safety training is just a good constant reminder. Many, a lot of these messages they might have heard before, but to be reminded from different people in a different perspective is always a, a positive uh, lesson for them. So. According to avfarmsafety.com, Canada's third most hazardous industry is agriculture. In 2014, there were 25 deaths in Alberta alone related to farming, making training days like this even more important. Nick Nielsen, Newcap Television. Emergency Preparedness Week continues in Lloydminster. Preparing for your family to evacuate means having an emergency kit ready to go with food, water and a change of clothing. But don't forget about items for our four-legged family members as well. Brittany Matika with more. During the Fort McMurray wildfires, many animal owners were not prepared to evacuate with their pets. The SPCA stepped in to help evacuees. Taking custody of those animals on behalf of owners who were unable to uh, go back to their homes to retrieve their animals. So we took custody for them and looked after their animals while they were getting their affairs in order. The city wants to be prepared in case an emergency happens here and ensure pet owners are prepared as well. We don't want people leaving their pets behind. We want them to take their pets with them. Um, sometimes we expect an evacuation to be a short period of time and things change and maybe people are going to be out of their houses longer. So what we've done is on our website, um, LloydminsterSPCA.com, we actually have introduced an emergency preparedness section um, of the website and that actually has a list of um, a variety of different items that you want to have prepared for uh, in the event of an emergency in case you have to leave um, your home with your pets. The SPCA has also created a free pet registry to be used in case of an evacuation or emergency emergency situation to allow officials to know if there could be pets left within your home. Brittany Matika, Newcap News. And the Lloydminster SBCA was the most recent recipient of the Boundary Ford Gives campaign. The shelter was presented with a check for $5,000, which they say was a pleasant surprise. It's always great uh, to, to receive a, a donation of any kind, uh, but certainly when it's a, a significant uh, donation, it's, it's really wonderful and, and certainly the fact that it came as such a surprise because um, you just never know with donations when they're going to come in and, and how. So um, it's always great news uh, when, when we get those phone calls. 
not to be selfish, but uh, I'm, a, I'm a big animal lover as we have some that are here right now. And uh, I, I have a rescue as well too. And uh, it just, it means a lot. And I know uh, this can definitely benefit for the community. And uh, I know it will, I know they appreciate it. Other recipients of the Boundary Ford Gives have been Lloydminster Comprehensive High School and the Pioneer Lodge. Punchon says they already have plans for how the money will be used. Obviously, there's so many areas that that can be, whether it's providing um, just overall cost of care, uh, including you know vaccinations, uh, food um, to make sure that they're um, fed while they're here, and obviously can uh, go towards um, important things like a spay neuter surgery. Boundary Ford says they will be giving around $50,000 in donations towards local charities and organizations this year. While well, skipping to the pace of a rope looping around us is something most of us experienced at some point growing up, but this activity is also an effective method to maintain fitness at any age. In this week's Healthy Living, Josh Ryan explores the benefits of jump rope in warm-up, training and competition. <laughs> The jump rope for heart event at St. Mary's brought every student outside to try out their skipping skills, an activity Joan Hill appreciates for its inexpense and visible results. Their foot speed is better, their agility, and, uh, and just their rhythm, just their rhythm. They get a good cadence when they're skipping. Jump rope has grown in popularity around the world, combining gymnastics and dance with a ton of cardio. A lot of people who maybe like had an interest in dance or gymnastics but didn't quite find they fit in with that group but they seem to find their way to jump rope. It's also frequently used by a variety of athletes in other sports to help fine-tune their agility, coordination and other athletic attributes. Boxers, wrestlers use it to get in shape, gymnasts, uh, lots of uh, different athletes will use skipping as a part of their training. Devin Burgess makes it a mandatory part of his classes at Lloyd Boxing Club for warm-up and often cool-down. little better than running I think you know it's just easier on the knees and whatnot too and you're landing on your toes so much. They say that usually about three minutes of jumping is equivalent to 12 minutes of running. That's because skipping utilizes almost every muscle in the body and each energy system. It works your upper body and your lower body and it's a it's pretty much a full body workout. We usually do sprints while we're skipping 30 seconds at a time or whatever as we're skipping and uh, this helps bring up the heart rate. And for kids, it's a great starting point for learning how to remain healthy later in life. How do you keep your heart in shape? How do you keep it uh, so that when you're not 40, you're not having a heart attack? Josh Ryan, New Cap News. The challenges of calving season have spilled over into spring after winter gave us a late season reminder at the end of April. In this week's agriculture report, Gerard Lampau meets with an area producer to see how the young calves are recovering. We've had calves born at colder temperatures and they've been fine, but being that cold and damp for that long, it was, it was a lot of stress on the calves. Spring had to be reset this year as the last week of April saw heavy wet snow every day with temperatures just around zero. Darcy Edelston is calving out about 360 cows, mainly black Angus, over 4,500 acres. Ranching has been in his blood for some 111 years as his great-grandfather first came out to Alberta in 1906. He usually calves in early spring, but this year it's been a lot of work to give the calves a good start. April's been a challenging month, you know, all along, you know, since we've been calving anyway. You know, we, we had that initial snow just before Easter, and then there's been two or three snows through, throughout. But it was just, I don't know if it was just the duration of it, but last week it just seemed to really take its toll on everything. Calving season is always a challenge, whether at minus 40 or minus 1, but with the snow being heavy and wet, the dampness never let up, making it tough on the calves and the family operation. It seemed hard to get the calves going. You know, we were, we were rotating calves in and out of the house, warming up, make sure they had a drink, and back on their, you know, back on their mama cows, and, and uh, so it, it was a lot of work. Darcy's father always started calving at the end of February. Since May 1st, he wanted to start seeding. But since taking over the farm, he has moved away from grain and focused on calving in April. My wife and I, Lori and I, have, have uh, changed the operation a bit. We've gone to more cows and less grain. And so we've, we moved to April for better weather, you know, supposedly. March can be a challenging month to calve. The weather tends to be challenging in March. Edelston will be watching his calves over the next couple weeks as these little guys battle off the effects of the cold moisture, which makes them susceptible to pneumonia and scours.
being cold and damp like that, they get, they're, they're stressed, so their immune system isn't built up, you know, isn't going the way it should. Edelston will press on with calving season. After all, this isn't the first time that old man winter has stuck around. Gerard Lampau, Newcap News. This is Newcap Sports. Lacrosse season is back in the border city and after splitting a pair of weekend games, the Lloydminster Extreme held their home opener at the Civic and Lance Phillips was there to catch all the action. There's something positive to be said for starting fast, but on Wednesday that positive turned into a negative for the Extreme. Four first period goals was the start they needed, but one second period goal proved to be the difference in a 13-9 loss to the Lakeland Heat. Yeah, just uh, the offense dried up and it dries up. You, you can't go periods without scoring goals. And it's just the guys not moving their feet. At times, you know, we just got a little lazy on offense. Same with defense. We had the, that's the definition of not playing a full 60. We had, we probably played a good 45, but, you know, those lulls really killed us again. Well, they, that team's been playing with each other since they've been growing up, junior all the way up, right? We're a new team. Uh, score, what, 12-9, not too bad. Uh, they're fast and... Uh, we are going to come back even stronger next game. Turnovers were a major part of Lloydminster's play and an area of their game that isn't new to Murray. That's something that we've been uh, struggling with for seasons. It's something that we keep coming back to. That is, it's something that is our definite Achilles heel. The amount of turnovers we have is, is it's far too much. And ball retention is a huge part of lacrosse. And if, if they don't have the ball, they cannot score. The team's record drops to one and two, and despite the early season struggles, there is reason for optimism. Oh, when we were moving on offense, I thought we were doing a fantastic job. It was looking really good. The pick and roll was working constantly, but then when it, when no one's doing it, it's, it, there's just there's just not a lot of options out there. Yeah, like being young, uh, we got lots of energy. The boys are fast. They all want to be here, so I think uh, that helps out a lot. Lance Phillips, Newcap Sports, Lloydminster. Well, Lloyd Comp is very well known for its football program, but rugby, also a sport the Barons take very seriously. Lance Phillips was at Armstrong Field yesterday and has this report on a Barons team making its first home appearance of the season. Lloyd Comp's boys rugby team is off to a great start. On Wednesday, the Barons earned their second win, 38-22 over Lashburn. The difference? 24 second half points compared to Lashburn's five. You know the biggest thing is uh, we didn't drop the ball, we caught the ball. So if you would have noticed the first half, we probably dropped the ball just at a knock on, which is a turnover, about five times. I feel we got the ball out more and uh, went out wider. And then when we, when we got down to their end, then uh, we started pushing through. On Cold Lake, we kind of lost our, our game in the second half and this time we kept our composure all throughout the game. After the game, Wittrikesh made the point that he wants to see more of his imposing athletes run through the opponents, and that strategy is beginning to pay off. Well, it, uh, it changes the dynamic of the game when you can have players that make positive yards and um, get their defense on the back foot, which puts us on the front foot, which allows quick ball to get it wide to score. Wednesday's play was a big step up from a weekend loss in Cold Lake, and it's clear the Barons are improving daily. Oh, our defense got a lot better, communication got a lot better, offense and spreading out got a lot better. Oh, defensively. Uh, so that's probably where we struggled most in defense. Uh, so if we looked at Cold Lake, we were still bunched up around the ball, almost making a semicircle around the ball and then reacting. And so that's what we really focused on was getting on the, on the gain line, spreading out, when the ball comes out, we come forward as a unit and make a tackle versus just reacting to where the ball goes. Lance Phillips, Newcap Sports, Lloydminster.